in the world of The Sopranos, who truly wore the crown as the best mafia boss? Tony Soprano or one of the eight contenders who graced our screens? Join us as we unravel the intricate power play, dissecting each boss's strengths and weaknesses. But hold your verdicts as we reveal a shocking truth. Tony may not reign supreme. Amidst the upheaval in the Lupertazzi crime family, Doc briefly assumes leadership after Johnny Sack's passing and Phil Leotardo's hospitalization. Young and tall and tan and lovely. However, his impulsive decisions only lead to chaos and disorder, showcasing his lack of foresight. Phil, upon his return, pushes for his protege, Jerry Torciano, to take charge. But Doc's reckless actions result in a disastrous hit on Jerry, angering both Phil and Tony Soprano. The tension escalates, and Doc meets a grim end in a hail of bullets outside a massage parlor. His demise serves as a stark reminder that unbridled ambition often leads to a hefty price in the cutthroat world of organized crime. One can't help but wonder that if Doc had handled his fork more carefully, it might have saved Doc from an untimely fate. In the world of The Sopranos, Silvio Dante stands out as more than just Tony Soprano's conciliaire. He's the strategist, the voice of reason, and the ally you'd want in any mob conflict. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. When Tony gets shot unexpectedly, leaving him in a precarious state, Silvio steps into the role of acting boss, albeit temporarily. Running the family business isn't a breeze. Tony had always warned that being number one wasn't a walk in the park. You got no f***ing idea what it's like to be number one. Every decision you make affects every facet of every other thing. Silvio found that out the hard way. When Bobby, Vito, and Polly started bombarding him with questions and issues, it hit him hard. Silvio's nerves couldn't handle the pressure, and he ended up in the hospital with an asthma attack. It's a clear sign that while some folks might excel as advisors, the boss chair might not be the right fit for them. Being a boss takes a certain level of resilience and calm under pressure that not everyone possesses. It's too much to deal with almost. And in the end, you're completely alone with it all. But Silvio isn't merely a placeholder. He's Tony's trusted advisor, always ready with a solution, whether it's handling the volatile Richie April or the unpredictable Ralph Cifaretto. Plus, Silvio's persuasive skills are second to none, able to sway Tony even in the heat of the moment. While others may toy with disloyalty, Silvio remains steadfast. Despite Polly's grumbles, Richie's scheming, or Ralph's plots, Silvio stays true, a devoted soldier in Tony's ranks, with loyalty as his guiding principle. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> Johnny Sack, he's a character with some serious clout. Remember that time he okayed a hit on Ralphie just because of a joke about Ginny? I want you to sanction the hit on Ralph Cifaretto. It not only ticked off Tony, but also hit the family's pockets hard since Ralphie was their cash cow. But that's not all. Johnny's got a habit of bending the truth. He fed Polly a line about being tight with Carmine, only for Polly to find out it was all a bluff. That kind of deception doesn't bode well for trust among friends. What's your name again? Polly Gaultieri. Jersey? Your father was run over by a trolley, right? And let's not forget the time he almost took out Carmine, risking a full-blown mob war with little Carmine. We're gonna take out Carmine Lopatazzi. Then there's the kicker, making a deal with the feds to shorten his sentence. Smart move? Maybe. But it sure didn't win him any brownie points with his old crew. They shut the door on any future partnerships faster than you can say, rat. Are you f kidding me? You don't ever admit the existence of this thing. As Silvio wisely put it, some guys are better at being number two. Johnny Sack thrived as a supporting player with his calm demeanor and savvy moves. But when he aimed for the top spot, things went south fast. He turned hostile, anxious, and arrogant. You know what, John? I'll give you a dignified F yourself. Alienating his longtime allies and causing chaos with his reckless decisions. In the end, Johnny Sack proved he wasn't cut out for the boss role. What's this stuff? You win now? In the complex world of The Sopranos, one contender for the title is Phil Leotardo. God rest his soul. A man whose aggression seemed to overshadow any rational thinking. Emerging from prison with a chip on his shoulder. I did 20 years. 
Phil pursued vendettas against Tony Soprano's crew with a fervor akin to a dog with a bone. His intolerance extended beyond mob business to his misguided notions of masculinity, as seen in his over-the-top reaction to Vito's coming out. And that f ass cornhole and f suckers like married my cousin. Despite his flaws, Phil commanded respect from his men. F you waiting for? Get lost. Embodying the old school wise guy ethos by keeping his mouth shut during a 20 year prison stint. I wanted a f woman, but I compromised. I jacked off in a tissue. Even Tony begrudgingly acknowledged Phil's effectiveness in maintaining order during Johnny Sachs' incarceration. But Phil's pride and inability to move past personal grievances led to unnecessary conflict, culminating in his demise at a gas station, resembling a scene from a horror flick rather than a peaceful picnic. Ultimately, Phil's downfall stemmed from his inability to forgive and his relentless pursuit of power and revenge. While he showed promise as a mob boss, his fatal flaws prevented him from enjoying a long tenure at the top. My cousin's dead. F you. Hey, we were making headway here. I didn't mean to f you meant, cocksucker. Plus, let's not forget that Phil got very emotional when he drank wine, and that's bad for business. You know the wine makes you emotional. Because I got an empty f stomach. When considering the best boss in the Sopranos universe, one can't ignore Junior Soprano's calculated maneuvers, even under house arrest. Despite their rocky relationship, in the second half of the show, Junior wisely refrained from eliminating Tony, knowing the severe consequences. His decision to attend funerals, albeit for fleeting freedom, showcases his cunning nature. You got some set of balls, you know that? Sure, he tried to bump off Tony right at the start of the show. Next time you come in, you come heavy or not at all. But look at it from a mafia angle. Junior had his reasons legit in mob terms. Tony went behind his back, pulling off a slick move that cut Junior out of the loop. Uncle June's in a muff. What? Oh, did I say muff? <laughs> I'm a rough. That's a big no-no in wise guy land. So naturally, Junior was steamed. But here's the thing. Junior's not the mastermind behind offing Tony. Nope, that was Livia's twisted idea. She had her own beef with Tony, driven by her own dark motives. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Strange as it may sound, Junior cared about Tony. See, in the mafia, business is business and family is family. They're separate deals. Junior may have been ready to whack Tony for business reasons, but deep down, he had love for the guy. That's the soprano world for you. Where lines between love and business get blurry, but they still matter. In contrast, when Richie plotted against Tony, Junior surprisingly chose discretion over power. I'm better off with Tony. Definitely. He foresaw the grim outcome of challenging Tony's authority, opting to safeguard his own life. This demonstrates Junior's astuteness and pragmatic approach to survival within the Soprano crime family. However, some argue Junior's reign barely warrants consideration. He served as a mere pawn, shielding Tony from federal heat and maintaining Tony's ego. His taxing of captains and Hesh only alienated him further. Junior's easily manipulated, as we've seen with his dealings with Livia. His priorities seem to be more about maintaining his status as boss rather than looking out for the family's well-being. As Hesh pointed out, Junior's insecurities drove his actions, making him perhaps one of the worst bosses in the Sopranos universe. At least I can deal with my own problems, unlike some I know. In the realm of the DeMeo crime family, Jackie April Seenster steps into the limelight as the acting boss when Urkeley DeMeo heads to the big house. Tony Soprano, our resident wise guy, admires Jackie's ability to evade the law, earning him respect in the brains department. Jackie's reign isn't just about dodging jail, it's also a time of peace in the mob scene. In a world where bullets fly as often as wisecracks, that's no small feat. It takes real finesse to maintain peace, and Jackie's got it. But Jackie's not just street smart, he's also a wise dad. Unlike some mobsters who groom their kids for the family business, Jackie keeps his children far from crime. Perhaps he's onto something. After all, there's only so much room for mobsters and family photos. Although we don't know much about Jackie, what we do know is impressive. He became boss at a young age, seemingly on merit alone. He was fair and beloved by his soldiers. After his passing, he was remembered as a legend, and his tenure as boss was praised as peaceful, the ultimate compliment for a crime lord. In the complex world of mob politics in the Sopranos universe, Tony Soprano's cunning maneuvers often left his adversaries puzzled, wondering how they got outsmarted yet again. When he chose to let Junior take charge as boss, 
It wasn't merely a gesture of goodwill. You think I'm gonna mess with a guy like you? Huh? <laughs> what are you been pumping iron? Look at you, strong as a bull. <laughs> it was a calculated move straight from the Soprano playbook. While Junior relished his newfound authority, Tony quietly pulled the strings from the shadows, shielding himself from prying eyes and nosy agents. Thinks he's the king of kings. Truth is, every decision is made by me. Tony's talent for navigating the perilous waters of organized crime wasn't just about strength. It was about cleverness and subtlety. Every word he spoke to his subordinates was carefully calculated, every pause pregnant with significance. He understood that loose lips could sink ships, especially with the feds lurking around every corner. So he skillfully evaded their inquiries with the finesse of a master, never giving them the satisfaction of a slip-up. Throughout the Sopranos family saga, Tony's ability to stay ahead of the game kept him alive and out of prison. In my book, you get points for staying out of the camp. While others fell victim to bullets or betrayal, he remained the elusive kingpin of North Jersey, a testament to the power of street smarts over brute force. And as his story unfolded, we couldn't help but be amazed by the masterful puppeteer who turned every crisis into an opportunity. He just told you to shut the f up, and he told me to go f myself. Leaving us all to wonder, was it luck or simply the mark of a true mob boss? Well, here's a rule you might remember. I'm the mother one who calls the shots. Now, Tony Soprano, for all his strengths, has a glaring flaw that often gets in the way. His sentimentality and his tendency to mix family with business. Take his relationship with Tony Blundetto, for example. Blundetto's actions nearly sparked a full-blown mafia war. And while Tony eventually took him down, his hesitation and uncertainty only prolonged the conflict. In hindsight, Tony should have dealt with Blundetto much sooner, avoiding the war altogether. Instead, his delay ended up being a primary reason for the tensions between the Sopranos and the Looper Tatsis. I want your cousin on a f***ing spit. The same can be said for Christopher Moltisanti. Tony's soft spot for him blinded him to the dangers Christopher posed. Despite Christopher's numerous missteps and weaknesses, Tony repeatedly forgave him, seeing him as a potential successor. However, had Tony been more objective, he would have recognized Christopher's threat to the family and the business. Christopher was weak, had multiple addictions, and was the number one candidate to be a witness against Tony Soprano in court if the feds could find the right leverage against the natural canopy. So Tony's decision to send Christopher to the Irish pub in the sky is one of the smartest decisions Soprano has made in the entire series. I'm sorry, T. Sorry, T. In the end, while Tony Soprano had many good qualities as a boss, his sentimentality and willingness to overlook the dangers within his own ranks ultimately cost him and his family dearly. And if Tony Soprano is not the top boss on the list, then who is the best boss in the Soprano universe? Let's find out in a couple of seconds. In the sprawling history of mob bosses, Carmine's ascendancy in the 50s marked the start of a nearly four-decade rule, shaping things long before the Soprano's Sega kicked off. He wasn't one for flashy displays of power like some of the others. Carmine preferred to operate in the shadows, quietly pulling the strings. Carmine was cool and collected, a pragmatist through and through. His main concern was the bottom line, making money. The only real knock against him was his near miss during the mole dispute because he didn't stand up for Johnny against Ralphie, who was earning too much. We depend on this guy. There are millions of dollars at stake. We can't afford it, John. However, it seems to me, Carmine made the right decision because he thought from a business point of view and not from an emotional perspective. You want? I'll demand these text. Which gives him extra points as a mafia boss. After Carmine passed away, Bobby reminisced about the old boss, painting him as a smart operator who pioneered the profitable scheme of point shaving, which kept the cash flowing for the crew. Sure, his high taxes almost got him into trouble, but overall, Carmine's leadership was marked by practicality and foresight. And let's not forget, Carmine held power for a staggering 40 years without ever going to jail. Oh! That's no small feat. It speaks volumes about his leadership and effectiveness as a boss. So when it comes down to it, Carmine was the ultimate businessman and the best boss in the Sopranos universe. When it comes to the hierarchy of power in the Sopranos universe, one name that stands out is Ercole DeMio. He held the reins of the DeMeo crime family for decades, starting way back in the 50s. 
His influence was such that even prominent capos like Junior Soprano, Richie Aprile, Feech LaManna, Ray Curdo, and Johnny Soprano answered to him. Among them, Johnny Boy seemed to have a special place in DeMeo's trust circle. Some even thought Johnny ran North Jersey instead of DeMeo himself. But here's the catch. Despite his powerful presence, DeMeo was hardly seen throughout the series. His character remained mostly a mystery, with just a few mentions in the first season. In the prequel film, The Many Saints of Newark, we catch a fleeting glimpse of him, portrayed by showrunner David Chase. In the intricate web of The Sopranos, one boss stands out. Annalisa, the sole female leader in the tangled universe of the show. Leading the Zuka family with both grace and authority, Annalisa made her debut in season two, surprising Tony Soprano and his crew during their Italian escapade. As Tony ventured into the Neapolitan scene, aiming to expand his empire, he encountered Annalisa. Her rise to power wasn't marked by brute force, but rather by cunning and tact. Unlike the typical bravado of mob bosses, Annalisa wielded her influence with a finesse that even Tony found intriguing. Amidst negotiations and mutual respect, a subtle flirtation filled the air. But business remained the main focus, with Annalisa sealing the deal by offering up one of her prized soldiers, Furio the Beekeeper, to join Tony's ranks in America. Give me $1,000. Now let's not forget the boss of the Polieri crime family, who makes a brief appearance in the final season. This seasoned mafia figure steps into the limelight to negotiate a peace deal between the New York and New Jersey mobs. He's no newcomer to the game, having been entrenched in the mafia for decades. His wisdom shines through as he realizes that the ongoing conflict between the two families is detrimental to everyone's bottom line. But what sets him apart? Well, it's his savvy approach to leadership. Despite his advanced age, he's adapted to the changing times by strategically taking a backseat within his own family. This move not only shields him from unwanted attention, but also allows him to operate discreetly from the shadows. If you're as intrigued as we are by the blurred lines between fiction and reality in the mob world, then you won't want to miss our full video on the Sopranos actors turned criminals in real life. Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay wise and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching.